finding their new normal. normal. Welcome to the beginning of this series and um, get ready for some information and also sharing some information, not just a matter of us, um, you know, giving information. Uh, we want you to be able to engage with us um, during this message, during this series. We want to know how you're doing. Um, for example, this new new normal we're talking about is based on what's going on in our new world right now. We we're all kind of in a new place, and um, where are you? So uh, I, I want to remind you that uh, COVID nineteen didn't catch God God off guard. It caught many of us off guard. We didn't know what to do. Uh, we didn't know what was going on, and um, but. Um, it didn't catch God off guard. He was aware of what was going on. He saw what was happening. And there are many things that I believe that he already had um, made sure that we were, you know, able to take advantage of. In other words, he's he's entirely aware of the new technologies, Zoom and Facebook and Periscope and all of those other new technologies that assist the church in executing what I call his mission. God has a mission, and his mission hasn't changed, but we have to figure out some new ways sometimes how to do what he has called us to do. And so uh, I have a question for you as we start this off. What have you learned during the COVID-19 outbreak? What are some of the things, things that you've learned? Um, you know, has, has things been difficult? Have you had to learn some new things? Um, have you had to do some new things? I know many of you, you are essential workers and you you work in the medical field and a lot of things are different for many of us. But what have you learned? What about your, and I don't know what your specific type of work is, but what have you learned as an individual? What have you learned as a family? What have you learned as whatever your profession is? What have you learned during this outbreak Sometimes, you know, with all of the news media and everything else, even the political arena, one of the things that we've learned is you can't trust everybody. <laughs> and we've learned to focus on our homes. We've learned to focus on relationships. We've had to intentionally focus on relationships so that we can intentionally make things happen that wouldn't uh, may have happened in a different way uh, if it wasn't for the pandemic. But um, life is different, 
and we have to learn how to do what we need to do to stay connected. As we said, the first, you know, week of the pandemic, we said that we have to learn how to stick together without falling apart. And that, you know, that, that may sound like an oxymoron. How do you stick to, if you're sticking together, you're not falling apart. But many people are falling apart, although they're stuck at home together. And so we wanted, we're talking about sticking together wherever you are without falling apart on the inside, staying together in, on the inside and outside. And I uh, just want to preface this message, today's introduction at least, but most of this series uh, this is an insider's message. And when I say insiders, we're talking about people who attend church, who go to church, uh, normally go to church. Um, and and there's a definition for this if you look at the um, Barna group. Um, and I, sometimes it's anyone who's attended church or read their Bible. There's a couple different, you know, definitions for it. But if you've done some of this in the last six months, then you may be called an insider, especially if you attend on a regular basis. One of the things that we've learned is that, and we're being taught this, even if we've said this before, and that is that church is not a building. Church is not a building. Uh, we have a mission from God. There's a vision for the ministry that we do to carry out that mission. And then there's a strategy. And so we're going to talk about those three things a little bit today and see what changes do we have to make in order to still do what God called us to do. And so I have a question to get started with that. And that is, how do we engage insiders and outsiders? So both, how do we engage insiders and outsiders to become devoted followers of Jesus, uh, which improves their spiritual life, their personal life and their social life? In other words, uh, following, I believe following Jesus improves every aspect of your life. I believe that even if you don't believe in Jesus, if you do what Jesus said to do, your life would be improved. And so even if you're listening to me today and you don't believe all of the stuff that the church talks about, I, I invite you to listen to us in this series just to find out some things that Jesus is saying for the church to do and that we are uh, actually commanded to do that if we do them, I believe it would improve the lives of everyone and not just your spiritual life, but your personal life, your mental life, your intellectual life, your social life, your financial life, all of those things. And I'm sure we've heard uh, different answers to this question, you know, prior to uh, March 23rd. Be, and I'm saying that because on March 23rd is when um, in Michigan here and in many other uh, states were around the same time, if not sooner, or a little later, where we received stay at home orders. And which kind of changed things. Now at GTM, we didn't need this order to learn to stay home. We had actually met the Sunday before we met the Saturday, a group of our leaders met that Saturday. And we decided based on what the medical, uh, the doctors and everyone else is saying, you know, in that field, uh, we can't manage this if we have you know an outbreak here at our service. So we didn't have service that Sunday. And we haven't been in, we haven't had service since then. And so since those orders, and they were in place from March 23rd, and I looked up the dates, uh, from March 21st to March 23rd to June 1st, uh, the, the orders were lifted um, with different phase openings on June 1st. And right now we're in phase four. And um, phase five would include some other things that, you can normally do like the gym gyms and other things. I know in phase four with the mitigation uh, determinations that we have in place and different businesses have in place, you can open with those things going on. And so uh, we're in phase four. So that means a lot of different things for the church. So let's talk about that. And that's why we're talking about the new normal. So for church gatherings, even in phase four, there needs to be a limited church gathering, a limited number of people uh, to whatever, depending on your capacity. Um, yeah, that's what it's determined by. I, I remember at one point uh, the governor had said 50 and then they said 25 and then they said 10. Well, it's really determined now by the number of people that you're able to fit in a, in a, a room or in a, in a space where they can also practice social distancing of being six feet 
uh, apart from other seated occupants who may be of the same grouping and same family household. And so we will learn to do some things uh, based on this and roll some things out as we begin to open up. We will, GTM will probably, we will open up in a, what I would call a hybrid situation where we will actually encourage you not to come and those who need to come. And I, there are many people, see, I want to reach everybody and there are some people who are not on social media. There are some people who still haven't been to a church service since March. And there are people who are just began to attend our church. Um, and there, are, uh, and you may feel like, man, who's not on social media. Uh, there are plenty of people who are not on social media, some that you may know. And so we're, we're looking in this series, we're looking to come up with ways, even people that are not on social media can still uh, become a part of the church and be a part of what God is asking us to do. And so remember, there's no set number uh, in as far as the capacity. It's just whatever you can fit in the space that you have and still practice social distancing. Another thing is that that the churches are required to do if we do open, that is defies the plan uh, for regularly checking with attenders, people who would attend at your church. You need to know who attended because if there's some kind of outbreak, you need to be able to help um, the officials to track those people down and let them know that you were here, this person was sick or that person was sick. And that's one of the reasons that we haven't reopened yet because that that's a lot of work to monitor and to do that. But we need to do that to maintain the health status of our church and the health status of the community that you live in, in your household. So we have to devise a plan to be able to do that. So some of the things that's happening in the middle of doing all that is, you know, there's different functions that go on in the church. And uh, if you're just tuning in, as I said earlier, this is more of an insider's message. You will learn something about the church if you listen to us today. And hopefully uh, our goal is to always say something that is of value to whether you're an insider or an outsider, church goer, or, or, or an unbeliever, or even an atheist. We believe that we will say something that will be of value to your life today that you can live out this week and add to your life and increase and improve. And so here's some things, again, that as, as church gathers, we there's a worship service. So there's things that go on in a worship service that would be a lot different today than they were back in March. Um, do, you know, I have friends uh, who shared the pulpit, shared the choir stand. There are people who are dead today who were alive in March um, and who are gone now because of the way we did worship services and the way we, well, the way we did them then. And if we continue to do them that same way now, it's deadly. <laughs> it could be deadly. Same thing with hygiene and safety. We have to practice a different hygiene and safety rules. And we'll talk about all of that, but I'm just giving you an overview of some things that would, that would have to change our children's area. All of those things would have to change. Our, we'd have to create and do non-contact greetings. I remember uh, two or three weeks before we shut down, we had already begun to do non-contact greetings, at least with elbows. Uh, we were doing that. And, um, but that may not be the smartest thing to do either now because, you know, you cough in your elbow, right? That's what you do, coughing in the pit of your elbow. And then now you're coughing on your arm and then you go and rub elbows with somebody else. So that's not necessarily a good way to greet people either. Because you have to basically, we, we have to treat each other as if we have the COVID-19 disease. And that way we, we are protecting the other person from um, getting it from us. Many people who even wear masks, who a lot of people don't believe in wearing masks for whatever reason, uh, it's become political and, and a lot of crazy stuff about wearing a mask. And But even those of us who wear a mask, I think subconsciously sometimes we feel like we're protecting ourselves when we wear a mask, unless you're wearing uh, one of the um, the masks that, you know, the 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 N95 mask, you're really not protecting yourself. Uh, you're protecting others. It's, the mask is really just like a new handkerchief. Instead of coughing in your elbow, you're and talking and 
and, and things flying out of your mouth. Um, it's, it's inside of your mask. And so we're learning to do that so that we can keep everybody safe. Uh, also, socially distant conversations. You know, usually in church, as soon as church is out, we are we're right together and we're, you know, we're conversing. And because that's the time when we want to get together and, and, and mingle. And now we'd have to learn how to do that socially, either in the parking lot or somewhere where there's some space where we're able to do that. So a church in the world, how do we carry on the church in the world? How do we carry on what God's given us to do and, and commanded us to do? I believe we have to re-image ourselves. We have to reimagine. So here's the question. What does it mean for um, the church to be to be in the world, but not of the world. And and if you grew up in church, you've probably heard that a lot. We talked about, you know, as far as our conduct, what does it mean to be in the world and not of the world? Uh, and we need, we need to re-image that. We have to re-imagine that today. What does it mean to be of the world? One of the things of the world means, and, and this is different for us, but of the world does not mean on a separate track from the world. We, we felt like we had to be isolated from the world. We are not isolated from the events that happen to the world. The same thing happens to the world, happens to us. Uh, some, of the, some, some believers may try to think, you know, that that's different uh, because I'm, I'm a member of the church. You know, this doesn't happen to me. Uh, well, when it rains, it rains on you just like it rains on everybody else. If there's a virus in the earth and if there's a virus if, out there and someone else could catch it, you could catch it too. So the church is not totally isolated from the same events that, that the world is. We're Although we're in the world and we are not of the world. One of the things we have to do in, as far as re-imaging ourselves is to begin to ask some of these kinds of questions. What is God up to in the world? What is God up to in the community? Uh, these things, God always takes advantage of things that happen. Even if some human being started it, God is going to get in there and do something. His providence is going to be at work to work on behalf of the people in the earth and not just Christians, but working on behalf of getting people to see who he is and reveal himself to people. God wants everyone to know of his love, the, the real love that he has. And so he, he wants to, he wants us to find out what's going on in the daily lives of people. Um, you know, they're at home. There's been more focus on home now because we've been at home. And so um, that's some of the questions that we can ask ourselves. How is God reflected at home in the community as far as even your your gifts, your personal gifts that you have, how you operate, your personality? How is it reflected in the home? How are others in your home affected about about by your, you know, gifts and how are others in your home affected by the way you normally live and so uh, how is God affected in your office space you know where you live these are these are some questions we need to ask ourselves is how is God reflected how do we reflect him because that's really that's really our mission in your neighborhood how is God reflected there uh, in your workplace how is God reflected in your community? How is he reflected there? So I want to look at a, a scripture here where Jesus and his disciples, um, they were right outside of Caesarea Philippi. And this is a, this is a city, big city, main city at this time in, in the world uh, that had been built by, um, you know, from Caesar and, 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 and named after him. And so one day, Jesus and his disciples, they were in the region of where this whole city was. And Jesus asked them, who do people um, say that I, the son of man, is? And and they began to tell him, some say that you're John the Baptist. Some say that you're someone else. And remember, John the Baptist had been beheaded. And so some say you're Elias. Some say uh, they had all these different answers. And Jesus says, well, who do you say that I am. And um, Peter said, well, um, you are, you know, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And 
sometimes I don't think we realize what that means based on where they were. The fact that the scripture tells us that they were in the region of uh, Caesarea. See, Caesar, in, 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 before Jesus was born and ever came to earth, in 42 B.C., Julius Caesar, he was, you know, he was deified as a divine Julius. He was uh, the divine. They, they made a god out of him. And so then when he, uh, after he was assassinated, his son, who's, which was adopted, I believe really, really his nephew, Octavian, better known as, as Augustus, um, in, in, you know, in like 27 B.C., he became known as the son of the divine Julius or simply the son of God. So in this situation where they're looking at this city that's created where um, basically by what Greeks and people in that day believe was, you know, the son of a God, you know, Jesus is saying, who do you say I am? And for Peter to say, you are the son of the living God. He's making a distinction between that. You are the son of any kind of Greek God or anything else. He's saying you are the son of the only real living God. And that's what Jesus wants to get into the earth is the life of God into all of the earth. At that time, Rome ruled everything. And, and the uh, children of Israel, the Israelites, they were affected by that in a very negative way. And so when they, when they, when they look at the place where they are, this whole big city, the whole big region that's controlled by Caesar and Rome, and for Peter to say, I believe that you are the son of God, the son of the living God, then Jesus responded to Peter in this way. And so let's take a look at what Jesus said. He said, now that I, now I say to you that you are Peter, which means a rock. And upon this rock, I will build my church and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. And Jesus is looking at the fact that Peter recognizes that he is the son of the almighty God. And Jesus is right away beginning to declare what his purpose is. He's saying, I, so I'm the son of the living God, the, the son of the only God, the real God uh, who's alive. I am the son of that God. And he's saying, I'm going to build my church in regards to what happens in the world or in hell and any place else. No one will be able to conquer it. So Jesus had a, a purpose in mind for his church in one of the things that he said near the end of his life, well, actually after he had been risen from the dead, as before he ascended to go back to heaven, this is, this, this is the scripture in Matthew. He said, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. This was new to the Jewish community at that time because they had only been evangelizing the Jewish communities. And here Jesus is saying, Go and make disciples of all nations. You've been disciples. I've been, I've discipled you for the last two and a half to three years. Now I'm telling you to go and make disciples of all nations, every ethnic group, go and make disciples, cause them to know who God really is. Cause them to know that the son of the living God is bringing life to them. He's bringing life to every single person, not just to the Jewish community, but to every person on earth. I am here to bring life to every single one of them. So make disciples, cause them to learn about me, cause them to learn of who I am, cause them to learn of the love of God. They won't trust it at first, but cause them to know that my love is real uh, to them. And so uh, when he said make disciples of all nations, he went on to say, this is really the mission that he's talking about. And he said, baptizing them, teaching them to obey all the commands that I've given you, baptizing them, causing them to um, take on the identity, the same identity that I have with you. And that is that you are part of the body of Christ and that this life that you can now live, you can live this life that will give real life to you. Remember, 
uh, last week when we, in the other series when we talked about light and life and Jesus being the light of the world and the life of the world. So Jesus, that life is coming to not just church people, but to anyone who would open their hearts to receive that life. And they're benefiting from it, even if they don't know who Jesus is, because the life comes to us. And as we expose ourselves to others, they can experience that light. And so he's saying, teach them. This, this was the connection to life. This is everybody's connection to life. And this is the mission. So the mission is become a connection, become a place where people can experience the life that I give. And so our, we looked at this scripture years ago. We looked at this scripture in 2014. So now six years ago, six years ago. And we came up with this mission statement on September 9th, 2014. And that is, we want to, we're saying to, our mission is to go into strategic parts of the geographical world. So wherever we are, we don't believe that we're only supposed to affect people in Flint, but this is where we are right now geographically. But strategically in every, in different parts of the geographical world and online world and lead people, not push them, not coerce them, but lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. And so when you lead someone, you lead by example, and you also encourage them and you give them steps to take as they follow you and as they are following. So when people learn to do this, this is our mission to go into strategic parts of uh, the geographical world, wherever we are. See, it's not even, it's not only our desire, even as we reach people in the online world today, wherever you are listening to us today, uh, it's our desire to at least visit you, visit the people in your area, get to know you, get to know the people in your area and expose people to who we are in the earth. That's really our goal. There may be a time when there becomes a church planet where you are. And so that's th this is our mission. And we want to establish uh, both this virtual world and the ground campuses to support those growing relationships. We want to put things in place uh, that support that and, and the relationship that we are, you know, connecting you with God and connecting you with others. Uh, we want to establish places where you can learn to grow in those relationships. And so the, I look at it as a three phase part here. We we have a mission and therefore we have a vision for that mission and we have a strategy for that mission. And so the mission is the part that never changes. The mission that God has given us never, ever changes. And so uh, sometimes I think we may uh, get things a little confused and we think the church has to be the way church always has been. Um, even church now, when I experienced church before the pandemic, when I came to Michigan, church was a little bit different than church was in Mississippi when I grew up, you know, in the 60s and 70s. Uh, church was a little bit different, although it was mainly the same, but we've, we've migrated. Things have happened. You know, I think about when we went to church, our church was in a little town called Tutwiler, Mississippi, Tutwiler. And we used to drive there. That's the, you know, my grandfather was a pastor, but he also pastored a couple other churches in a couple other local uh, areas. But that's the one where my family attended uh, before I grew, moved in with my grandfather and started going wherever he went. We went to the Tutwiler Church of God in Christ in in in, uh, in Tutwiler, Mississippi, and so, but that was a church, and that was really the only thing that we did out of that church. We may have eaten there on Sundays that, because we we're going to be back there Sunday evening, but we gathered together, we did things together, we created relationships there together, um, and. Uh, during the week, though, we went back to our places. Many of us live, you know, miles and miles apart. No one, hardly anyone lived in the town where the church was. So we, we tore down all of our church stuff, our equipment, everything, took it back home. And so church was kind of different than even church is now. Well, the mission is the same. And we have to do we have to make disciples and cause people to know who Jesus is. But the vision and the strategy, they must change with the circumstance. If we're going to be good business people, and I believe the church is 
Um, the church is an organization, it's organic, but it also is a business, and we have to treat it like a business. And so we have a vision that God has given us for the church, and we have a strategy, and we need to change those things based on the circumstances. I use an example. Uh, you've heard some of you, you've seen me talk about this example before. And it's like I, I look at the mission as you look at the mission like a, a flight plan where you have a goal in mind. And I'm going to share this with you. This was a flight plan uh, one day, actually June 28th last year, not last year, but in uh, 2018. This was a flight plan. I was flying back from New Jersey to Detroit. And I often do, as I often do, I'm on my phone and I log into the flight plan and all of that stuff. And I can, you know, I can chart where we're going. So as you can, you can see there, it was about 12.02 p.m. And um, I had my headphones on and I'm listening. But as you travel there, the dotted line shows you the charted path for the flight. The solid line that you see there, and let me put this up so you can see it bigger. Uh, the solid line that you see there is the actual flight in in action as it's happening real time and and the hindsight of where it's been. So you can see it appears that the flight, especially at the very beginning, if you look at the very beginning, it looks like we're just not we're going straight uh, up north from the New York area instead of going east back to Detroit. But you can see they started to go back east on that flight plan. And so the mission is to get there. How, but to get there, you may have to change your strategy. You may have to change your the vision of what you see. And that's what I want to explain to you when it comes to um, you know our church. There's a vision. We have a vision, what we see. And there, we created a vision based on what we saw at the time we created the vision. But it's right now. The vision is for what you see right now in the real world. What is it that you see? But you also have to have some vision for what can be. So you look at what you see now and you look at what can be. And that get, that's foresight. You have some foresight of what to what can be. You have some oversight when it comes to responsibility of all of that. And so one of the things that, you know, progressive thinkers say, people who are, you know, when it comes to vision, one of the things that they say, this is not my quote, but this is one of their quotes coming out of every crisis. So whenever you have a crisis, a lot of things happen in crisis, real leaders rise to the top. But one of the things that is said about vision when it comes to uh, the crisis coming out of every crisis, progressive thinkers and believers declare things will never be the same again. Um, there's some things that will happen that you'll say, well, I want to make sure this doesn't happen again. Uh, and, and great businesses, they do the same thing. You know, um, they look at things and say, we have to make sure that this can't happen again. And so vision really is the bridge between what we see right now and what could be based on the circumstances that's happening right now. So we have to have that sight, that, that insight, and make the connection for the future, and also the oversight of what we need to do to make that connection. So vision is that bridge that's between what we see right now and what could be uh, in the future, and we make that happen with some strategies. So without vision, um, you will not auto-correct as that, you know, that's really what was happening in, in that um, diagram that I showed you. There's auto-correct corrections that happen based on your destination. So based on f from, you know, uh, New Newark Airport to Detroit Airport, there's some auto-corrections once you're in flight. You have your destination already set. And based on your target, you, you have to, you know, keep your target in light of your current coordinates, wherever you are right now to reach your goal. You got to make sure that you're now spending energy to move towards your target, because the, if you're still moving in the same direction and using your energy to move in the same direction that you were when you left, you would be way off course because circumstances have moved you around. Um, if you look back at the, 
uh, diagram that I showed you, you know, whatever the weather was, I don't know if it was windy or whatever was happening, but if you could see underneath that chart, you know, we're, we're leaving New York on the East Coast and we're going across part of that area where you go across is um, Lake Erie. And that's kind of where we were at the time I took this flight, took this this picture of, of this. Um, and I noticed that something was different because really where we ended up, we ended up way north of Detroit, somewhere between Flint and, and Pontiac, and then flying back down south to Detroit. But the circumstances had us moved us and forced us to do some things. We had to come up the, you know, not me, <laughs> the pilot and the air traffic controllers to do some things to cause you cause that to end up in the direction that you needed to go. So you could end up where the target is, where you were headed and see um, if you, if you fly a lot, you've experienced some things like this. I, I was talking to Thomasine yesterday. We were reminded of, uh, one time we we had almost made it back to our target. As a matter of fact, we were flying back to Flint, to Bishop Airport in Flint. We were flying back here to Bishop Airport, and we were on we were descending on our way down. And as I usually do, I try to get me a window seat, and I'm looking out the window, and I can see the buildings, and I can see where we're going across, I always check out. We come down, you know, Bristol Road, and we're heading, you know, to the airport. And, and now I can see the runway below us. And just as we were about to touch down, immediately out of nowhere, I could see nothing. And I felt the G-force of the flight going straight up. And everybody was scared, you know. we So... Even though we were real close to the target, there was a circumstance there. The pilot came on later and said to us, he said that there was a there was a cloud just like right in the middle of, of the runway where if he tried to land, he wouldn't be able to see. And so the best thing he knew to do was to go straight back up. And so we went back up until that cleared. But that's how important a strategy is and the vision so that you can see where you're going. That's how important that is. And so our strategy now, we're forced to do some things different. We are forced to use some new tools. Uh, we're forced to meet in a new way that we didn't meet before. Now, for us here at Grace Transformational Ministries, we started this ministry with online you know, ministry in, in mind. Uh, for example, and God just worked it out. We didn't know exactly how we were going to do it when we were still, you know, uh, training at home. We had people in Tennessee and other people in Flint, the people in Flint and the surrounding areas. We would meet at our house on Sunday morning and we would um, it would be the equivalent of Zoom. We used um, some other um, strategies then where they could see us and we could see them. And we had, that's the way we did our training. That's where we did our meetings from like, uh, I believe from like April of 2014 till September of 2014. Um, no, 2015. So from February, 2015 to September, 2015. And thank you. And so, uh, but the week that we started and we didn't know how we were going to do this. The week that we started our first service, um, one of the persons who was really our tech, besides me, as far as technology, the guru was um, Lynn. And Lynn discovered Periscope. Periscope was kind of new brand then. She didn't discover it, but she does. She dis, she discovered it for us. And then uh, someone else also told us about it. But we were able to use that tool immediately when we started. So Lynn started doing it on her phone. And that's how we started getting the word out. And that's how we made the connection. But that was part of our, so that's always been a part of our strategy is online because that was the vision. So here, here's, here's what I'm saying is before we knew exactly how to do it, we knew that that's what the vision was. And we believed that God would give us a way to do it. And so when we scheduled our first service, we were able to go live on Periscope 
and actually do that. One of the first videos on YouTube that you'll see is a YouTube of us in, in our service. And my brother-in-law, uh, Pastor Lonnie Brown, we had them tune in to our broadcast via Periscope. And we have his picture at the same time they were in their services. And so we were able to create that, um, you know, that October day in 2015. And so we have to look at new ways of doing things that make things easier for people to connect with us and to make it easier for people to become a part of what God's created us to do. And so I want to share one other scripture with you, and then I want to give us a way, uh, some things that we're going to do to some strategies that we need to do to make this happen. This is in the book of Acts. This was really one of the first church business meetings that had happened. The church was growing like wildfire. Uh, Paul was out, you know, converted, getting Gentiles converted and talking to Jews. And you still had the, you know, the main assembly in Jerusalem um, where James, the brother of Jesus, was really the overseer of all of that. And so here we have the, in the 15th chapter, it says the whole assembly became silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul. Barnabas and Paul had come from Antioch and they had come from all the different towns between Antioch and Jerusalem as they are, you know, having meetings and people are being converted. And one of the big issues here was you have all these Jews uh, and Jesus was a Jew and they had the idea that if you wanted to become a follower of Jesus, you had to do what Jews do. And one of the main things they had to do if you were a male is to be circumcised. And so that was the big argument. And so they sent Paul and Barnabas back here to back to Jerusalem to find out what the you know church was going to say about this. So here it says the whole assembly became silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul telling about the signs and wonders that God had done among the Gentiles through them. So they're, they're give, it's just like any salesperson. They're telling them all the positive things. Here's the things that's going on and here's what has happened because their argument was you got to be circumcised. And then when they finished, James spoke up and said, brothers, listen to me. And he began to share with them what Peter had also said. Peter had already spoken. Simon, who was Peter, he says, Simon has described to us how God first intervened to choose, to choose a people for his name from the Gentiles. In other words, a people separated them from the Gentiles, uh, and that was the Jews. He said the words of the prophets are in agreement with this, where in the scripture that he's really quoting, where God is saying there, will be, there is a time coming where not just Jews, but Gentiles also will receive my word. And so now this time has come. And so James, if we jump, drop down to the 19th verse, he says, so here's the ruling on this. He said, it is my judgment uh, as the overseer of this ministry and of the church right now, therefore that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. So they could have said, yeah, the Gentiles got to be circumcised just like the rest of us. You know, we grew up this, this way. He said, we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. And what he's really saying is this. We need to remove anything that will get in the way of them turning to God. We need to remove things out of the way that will cause them to, it to be difficult for them to turn to God. And so James, the decision they made was they just, they said, no, you don't have to be circumcised. All you need to do is basically respect the Jews around you as far as eating and that kind of stuff and stay away from um, sexual sins. Really a couple of things there. And he said, but they removed all of the other things out of the way. And that's why we've coined this phrase. Uh, Pastor Thomasine coined this uh, some years ago. We make church easy. You may see that phrase uh, every now and then, if you're on the broadcast, if you're on live streaming, uh, we make church easy. That's what we're talking about. We're not just talking about make it easy so anybody can uh, just be a part of the church and you don't have to live right. That's not what we're saying. We make it easy for people to discover who God is, who Jesus is, discover the love of God, and ex not just discover it, but experience it. We need to make it easy for others to experience the love of God, to experience the grace of God. And so it's my goal 
as um, the lead pastor here, it, it's my goal to get all of us to embrace the mission, to embrace what God has said, to also embrace the vision. The vision will change. And actually, we want your input as far as the vision go. What do you see? And also your input concerning the strategy. How can we get there? How can we accomplish the mission? What are some things that you see that can help us accomplish the mission based on what's happening in our world right now? I can't see everything, and therefore we need other leaders to help us do the same thing. You see, I believe that following Jesus is uh, will improve your life regardless of even regardless of your beliefs. If you could if you could do what Jesus said to do, this is amazing because it's in doing what he's saying. If you would do what Jesus said to do, your life would be better. And so even if you don't believe in Jesus, you can't believe in the, the virgin birth. You can't believe a lot of things that you see in the Bible. If you would do what Jesus said to do, you will have a better life. And what we're inviting you to is a better life so that you can learn. And then possibly you will learn that this is how you gain the faith to actually believe that Jesus is the son of God. But it's a better life for you personally, a better life for you spiritually, emotionally, financially, socially, if we do what Jesus said. And that's why, you know, I'll put this up every now and then. It may not make sense to even see it, but do what Jesus said. Do what Jesus said. What did he say to do? Do what he said. And so what we want to do is anyone that's visiting us, and we've talked about this, you know, at our ground campus, uh, we want our guests to know certain things. We want our guests, it's very important to us that our guests know that whether you are a church person or a non-church person, you don't have to be a person that goes to church to come to our church. Uh, if some churches you can walk in and you can, if you, if you are a non-church person, you can tell right away that they didn't expect you to be there. Um, if you, whether you're a visitor, whether you're a believer or a non-believer or from a different religion, even if you're a skeptic, we invite you to come in any kind of guests. We invite you to come in. We want our guests to know several things that all, any kind of person is welcome, but here's something we want you to know. And that is, we see you. We want you to know that we recognize that you are here. And for us right now, that means we see you online. We know that you're here online with us. And we're happy that you're here online with us and that you're experiencing what we're experiencing online. And so we want, there's there's three things basically that we want them to know. Um, We want them to know that we see them. Um, you know, and now that means a little different thing than being able to say something to them after church, but it's how do we do that based on what's happening right now? And one of the ways that we do this, and let me put this on the screen for you. One of the ways that we would do this is what do they see? We want you to see um, the presentation. We want you to experience the chat. So even as you're talking back and forth in the chat, and we're going to upgrade that so that regardless to what platform you're on, what and when I say what platform you're on, some of you are on Facebook, some of you are on a different Facebook thread than others. And so regardless of what Facebook thread you're on or if you're on Periscope, uh, our ch- it will combine our chats together so we can see what each other are saying. Because I realize and recognize that there are people on Periscope that don't know what we are saying. And some of you, you've, you've, you've been clever and you've been helping us to do this. You log in the Periscope on, on one device, log in the <laughs> Facebook on another one. Or even if it's the same device, you're going back and forth. And, and when I look at uh, Thomasine over here, she has several devices going and she's trying to, you know, text back on one and on the other. And so we are finding a way to actually combine all the chats. So regards to where you are, uh, you can experience the response in, in the chat from everybody. But also to hear, we want to know, we want you to hear what's going on uh, and basically 
in this environment, you're just listening to me or whoever the presenter would be. But at the same time, right there in your home, right there in their home, on their couch, in their bed, in their car, wherever they are, they are not just hearing the presenter. I believe the Holy Spirit speaks in their spirit or in their ear, even as I am speaking. And it gives them the opportunity to see and experience church. And and really, it's a way you can experience church because it gives you the opportunity to talk in church without interrupting the speaker <laughs> and without interrupting others where where you are physically because you're typing. And so what they do, we want them to be able to see the presentation, see the chat, experience the chat, get in on the chat. Uh, that's why when we first started, you know, there were, we would get some people on Periscope who would say crazy things, who would say um, vulgar things, and we'd have to block them. Um, and so we don't want to have to block anybody because if you have that issue, you need what we're saying. And so um, we want you to experience God. We want you to experience God and we want you to experience us full of the love of God. We want you to experience all of this. So on our Sunday morning services, we want an environment even online. And when we go back to our physical facility, it will be both where really it'll be a hybrid situation where on Sunday mornings online and, and at our physical location, we always assume that we have guests in the room. We will assume that we have guests in the room, that we have guests with us online and wherever we are. And we welcome you. and We want you to feel welcome wherever we are. So here's a question that you can help us with some things to work on. These are some things that we need to work on. Does our online environment or our, your online experience with us and our building, if you've experienced that with us uh, and look forward to doing that in the future, does, do these environments look like we're expecting guests? D do these environments look like we can, ex you know, help your children and be um, of value to your children? So those are some things that we're working on now, even for your children, so that they can also experience something on Sunday mornings or uh, during the day on Sunday uh, as far as experiencing uh, what you're experiencing online. So what does it look like for church in the world? And um, this is because churches, remember we started this conversation off, we talked about the churches in the world, but not of the world. So the church, we've got to focus on equipping people to live as individuals in God's kingdom. It's really the kingdom focus is what we're talking about. And while experiencing whatever is going on in the world, we want people to be able to experience the kingdom of God, the love of God, the power of God. The church needs to focus on equipping people to do this, to live as individuals in this world. Um, and when we teach people to do this, here's our challenges for today. When we teach people to do this, your challenge is to help us as a ministry do whatever you can um, personally to make church easy. What is it that we can do? Um, you know, we need to learn some things electronically. What, what do we need to do? Who do you know that may be an expert in some of these areas? Uh, help us out. Make a connection for us. And, and then help us remove anything that gets in the way of people turning to God. That's important to us. We want to remove anything that gets in the way of people turning to God to God. Uh, we want people to be able to experience God and experience the love of God through us. And so if anything gets in the way, we want to remove that. We want to get that out of the way. And that's part of our vision. That way, that's part of the strategy and vision that will keep changing because we'll remove whatever needs to be removed. Also, help us create and maintain an environment where anybody can come and feel at home. Online, anybody can come and feel at home at the facility, the building. Anyone can come and feel at home. So let's create a place where people who are curious about God can feel comfortable asking questions and becoming a part prior to commitment. That is so important. Um, you know, when I was growing up, the first thing you had to do before you could become a part of the church community is make a commitment. And so 
I'm, we're saying just like Jesus said, follow me. Jesus said, follow me. He didn't tell them to make a commitment yet. He said, follow me. And as those who followed him, they made the commitment all the way to the point of committing their lives and gave their lives for the ministry. And so let's create a place where people who are curious about God, curious about Jesus, curious about the love of God, curious about even other religions and how that connects with what God is saying, give them a place where they can feel comfortable asking any kind of questions. And we want to learn how to do this even in an online environment since we can't meet physically together. But let's do whatever we can do to make church easy. So here's a couple of uh, action steps that you can help us to do that. And number one is always assume we have guests on, online on Sunday mornings. And as we assume that on whatever thread that you're on, then feel free to respond to people who are on there and welcome them uh, as a guest. And we'll have some key people to do that. But we want you to know just as a person, you can feel free to welcome somebody. Let our guests know that we see them and let them know that we're glad that they're here and let them know that uh, we're happy that we see that they are here online and that we're happy that uh, they're online. So if someone new shows up on your platform, welcome them, engage with them. If they have questions, um, you know, make sure that we get the you get their questions, see that there there are questions that need to be answered. And we're going to interject some things here. And you'll notice as as I wrap up. There's some things that we're doing a little different now that will help us to do that in an easier way, because I realized we needed to do some things to make it as easy as possible for people to make that connection. Cause I'm, I'm very passionate. I wanted you to, to see this. I am very passionate about our mission. Um, and I am very, uh, I'm very passionate about, the mission that God has given us in that mission, as I've shown it to you before, that that mission is, you know, online and individuals who are physically with us. So I'm very passionate about being able to physically meet together, even though we haven't been able to do that uh, in in several months. I miss you. Thomasine misses you. We miss you very much, and we need that, and we want to be able to do that. But I am equally as passionate about the mission, which begs this question. How do we reach people online who normally can't be reached? This also begs another question. How do we reach people who, who are not physically meeting, but also not online? There are people that I know who you know visited the church just before we sh the shutdown, and they, they're not online. They, they choose not to be online. And you can't make people go online just because this is the way we have in church. We have to find out how to meet them where they are, where, where, where they are. So um, for, you know, for some, Thomasine and I just visit them in their driveway, <laughs> just stop by and visit. And so we all need to learn to do these kinds of things because we need to find the new normal. It's going. It's new, and we need to find out what it is. And this is the introduction to this new normal. And this is still our, our strategy um, when it comes to transformation. We believe that God wants people to be transformed into the image of Christ. And so we invite people to take steps. And so when we do this, I'm going to show you today that we have a, a different way for you to make connections to these steps. Uh, for example, and as I go through this, I'm going to invite you. You may have listened to us today and you may be curious or you may be you may be skeptic and you're not ready to consider becoming a follower of Jesus. Uh, I do encourage you to keep searching and keep looking. But as you look and as you search, I do want to just ask you if you would be willing to pray a simple prayer with me where you're just saying, Heavenly Father, I am curious. And so if that's you today. Pray this prayer with me. Repeat this after me. Heavenly Father, I am curious. Thank you. And I'll give you a way to uh, make a connection uh, as we move on. Uh, but there are also people who have been a part of, you know, a ministry, who've even served in church, been, you know, they had a relationship with Jesus. And you've heard me today or you've heard me in some days before 
Uh, but you're ready today to reconsider following Jesus. I'm going to ask you to pray a simple prayer also. And that prayer, you're just saying, Heavenly Father, I am back. So if that's you and you feel like that today, and you can put those shoes on today, <laughs> you, those shoes fit you, then pray this prayer with me. Say, Heavenly Father, I am back. And thank you. I'll give you a way to connect with us also. But there are also some people who are listening to us for the first time, who are listening and considering Jesus for the first time, uh, becoming a follower of Jesus. You're considering this. You're thinking about it. And you're ready. Then there's a prayer I'd like for you to pray with us. Uh, and I'll lead you into this prayer and give you the, uh, the way to connect also. And if you would just repeat this after me, say, Heavenly Father, I believe. I believe Jesus died for me. I believe he was buried. I believe he rose from the dead and was seen by others. I place my faith, all my faith in Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Amen. And there's one other group of people that I want to address today, and that is, I just call them people for a next connection. Um, you want to actively be a part of what we're doing. You may not need to pray any of those prayers. You just want to connect with us. Uh, and I want to give all of you a way to connect. And I, this is the beginning of making things easy. So here's our next step connections for you. Next step connections. You, if you pray the prayer that you're curious, um, then I want you to text the word curious to 810-379-8999. If you prayed that prayer with us today, if you prayed the prayer that I am curious, just text the word curious to 810-379-8999. And if you prayed the prayer uh, of just saying, I am back, you know, I've once known who Jesus was, but you prayed that prayer with me today and you said, I am back, then just text all one word together, I am back. Text that word, I am back, to 810-379-8999. And if this is your first time um, praying the prayer of salvation or becoming a believer and accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then I want you to text the word believe to that same number, 810-379-8999. And all of the, each one of these words, uh, as you send them back to us, they put us on a track to follow with you in a different way. And so if you're just connecting, you don't need to pray any of those other prayers, but you'd like to connect with us. You'd like to know more about uh, GTM and what we're doing, and you'd like to help us to do that. Then text CONNECT, C-O-N-N-E-C-T. Just text the word CONNECT to 810-379-8999. And also, if this is just your first time online with us today, if you're a first-time guest and this is your first time being online with us, text the word WELCOME to the same number, 810-379-8999. And this helps us electronically to be able to follow up with you. As you text these words, you'll get, uh, you'll get uh, you know, a text back asking for information so that we can make the connection based on what you, what you desire us to do. And so I want to pray for you, and I want to invite you to invite others to this series and, um, and become an agent, an ambassador for God, even in this new normal. This is a time for us. This is a place for us to, as we find a way to help others to know and to help others to experience who God is. Let's find this new normal. Let's experience it together and let's help others to experience what that new normal is. So I'm going to pray for you and then I'm going to roll the announcements. Remember uh, in the announcements again, if you are online, I'll, I'll say this before I, I, I wind up here that next week, uh, next Sunday, we have an internal church health checkup meeting online. It's a Zoom meeting, but you need to register for it. So make sure you pay attention to the online announcements as they roll if you need to do a screenshot. Uh, but you want to text the word CH checkup 
to that same number, 810-379-8999. And that meeting will be on noon next Sunday. And as you register, uh, you'll give us your, you know, email that you want us to send the invitation to. We'll send you an invitation uh, to that particular um, meeting. And so uh, get ready for um, the announcements, and I'm going to pray for you right now. If you would bow your heads, please, uh, I'm ready to pray. Father, we thank you today. You've been so good to us. Uh, We thank you for this series, this new series, and we thank you for the opportunity to engage in ways that can connect us with others who can connect them with you so that your life, they can experience the life that you intended for all of us to experience. So help us to be your agents today. Help us to be your ambassadors this week. Help us to find ways uh, in this new era that we're in to make that connection with others so that they can make that connection with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, God bless you. And let's make that connection.